Welcome to Church on the Corner. I'm so glad you're here. If I seem a little subdued today, um, it's because I lost a friend this morning. Um, always difficult. But I thought I'd share that with you just so that you know. Um, let's have you stand and join me.
are thirsty And all who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of this mercy Rise out to deep. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit. Good morning, good morning. Please be seated. So good to see each and every one of you. And if you're here for the first time today, we are delighted and we hope we will serve you well. A very warm welcome to you out there in streaming land and Zoom land and later the internet land. We're glad you're with us today. Derek, that call to worship song is so, so important. I've never heard you bring that one before, and I've never heard it before, but I thought it was so appropriate just in general because we come to worship God, because we all come a little broken, a little hurting, needy of God. I, I confess that. But I think God had you pick out that song for yourself this morning. Yeah. Don't you think so? Yeah. And, and so that's just how personal our God is and how he knows the future and he knows just what you'll need. And so I hope that will really cause you to worship God in a new, fresh way. I'm glad you're here. And here's Stephanie with a little bit more about our church. Can we welcome her? Good morning. Good morning, Church on the Corner. Okay. Good morning to those out there in streaming land. So let's get into it. Um, can we have the announcements? There we go. What's going on? Today we have Mother and Father's Day planning, and that will be in the garden room at 11:30. Um, we are always going to try to make you know the special special days um, something special for. Our, any of our birth, adoptive, foster, spiritual, mentor, moms, dads, and grandparents. And of course, it's a great way to get to know each other, you know, get connected, make friends, have fun, and of course, there will be pizza. Um, next Saturday, um, we, there will be the men's gathering here, April 20th, 8 a.m. at the front of the church. And of course, in addition to feeding the soul, Pastor Tom will be feeding your bellies. Um, <laughs> So be sure to um, text or email your Noah breakfast order to him. Um, the event will continue onto the hike that will continue Mountain Men teaching series on growing as a strong man of God. And there will be a hike to Albany Hill afterwards. So we encourage you to bring a son, a friend, a grandson, um, and of course to wear the COTC t-shirt, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the following Sunday, um, April 21st, here um, at 1130 on the Commons, we will have the Women's Connection. And I personally, you know, love this event. It is a, always a very warm and loving and um, encouraging time to um, get to know each other. And we also study the Word of God and, you know, encourage, to, encourage each other to be, um, pardon me, a little nervous. <laughs> being encouraged to be equipped 
through his word and teaching each other. And of course, there'll be pizza. <laughs> Starting to see a common trend here. <laughs> um, and of course, um, the following Sunday, April 28th, 11.30 on the Commons, there will be the Newcomers Luncheon. Um, Pastor Tom has a list of the newcomers, um, which they will be sending out invitations to. But if you haven't received yours, which looks like this, be sure to contact Pastor Tom or Miss Dorothy to get yours. Um, if you are new, and of course this is encouraged to everybody who had not attended the one in last November, um, it's of course a time to get to know each other, form connections, and um, you can use the connection card in the chair or by using the QR code online. Did I do that okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good morning, Church on the Corner. Today I'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 22. The resurrection of the dead. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not, raised either, has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless, and if we apostles uh, would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost, and if our hope is in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into this world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. As many of you know we read the same scripture throughout the month, and I purposely picked that one after Easter, because Easter is about the resurrection. And I hope you're here to, to celebrate that again. It's historical fact. But I want to give a warm welcome to you. If you're still not sure about the resurrection, you're in the right place. God has led you to this place, because uh, we worship a, a risen God. And I think that will become clear today. Tyler's going to speak about it. We're going to sing about it. Uh, all of us that have become believers have the Holy Spirit that has given us new life, new meaning, new destiny. And so I'm really glad you're here today if you're still trying to figure out this resurrection thing. That's God's Word, Holy Word, and God's Word doesn't change. And so let's go worship Him now in prayer, because He gives us that prayer to go right up to Him and talk with Him, ask questions, and just share your concerns, and also just say, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you love us. It's very clear you have right from the start of this service today where you showed a tender mercy to our brother Derek who's struggling with the loss of a good friend unexpectedly, Lord. And Lord, we know you're no, no one's a favorite to you. We're all your favorite. And we know, Lord, for each person here today that needs that touch, that Holy Spirit, you will provide that touch. We pray, God, that you will help us now to enter into your presence with a free mind, a clear mind, an open mind. Let us sense your presence here today. 
and let everything we do be pleasing to you, knowing that, God, you, you give it right back to us in the way of encouragement, renewal, hope, wisdom, direction, all those things, God. And so we thank you for this time you give us today, Lord, to come together as your church, your family, worship you. And we particularly pray for those that are not yet there. They're not sure about you, not sure about the resurrection, that today would be the day. It just comes clear. It's like an aha, an enlightened moment. And today would be the day that they begin to call you Lord and Savior. We give you all praise and we give you all thanks. We love you, Lord. And we hope we can show that to you in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you're able. So I chose this song because it's um, Old Testament and we're in an Morning. Old Testament Morning. series. Morning, guys. And um, this, these lyrics actually come straight from the end of Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms uh, in the world ever. And um, <laughs> it's an amazing promise to <laughs> us all, people of faith, people who believe that Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us. It's called Surely Goodness and Mercy. You prepare a table
And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. And I will.
you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone? Let's sing that again. I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. And I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased in that I'm never alone. Sure, could, could, Father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Yes. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Well, hello. Happy Sunday. Glad, glad we're here. Um, 
I wanted to say something before we get into the text. We're going to be in Genesis 13 if you want to turn there, if you have your Bibles. But when Carlos was up here reading, can we give him a hand? That was awesome. There's audio Bible, right? Like you can listen to people reading the entire Bible. And my favorite is Johnny Cash. I don't know if everybody's heard Johnny Cash reading the entire Bible. It's, it is a revelation. And I thought of Carlos because he's got that deep voice as he's reading he might want to look into that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, cool. We're in Genesis 13, and I'm dropping papers. Um, and I love the fact that we are going through Genesis. I'm probably going to say that every time I'm up here because all Scripture is God-breathed, right? Every piece, as Jesus says, every jot and tittle, every little line on the T, every little dot on the I is relevant, not just relevant it conveys God's love for us. <clears throat> so Genesis 13, I'll go ahead and read, and then we'll pray. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, with Abram, sorry, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose among Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is, it not the whole, is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. <clears throat> the two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray for your presence to continue to be here. Thank you that we can come in communion with you. Thank you that you provide for us and you promise to never leave us or forget about us. Holy Spirit, I pray now that your words would be spoken to our minds, that we would understand more of who you are and that you would speak to our hearts, that you would hold us firmly and lovingly to guide us in your ways everlasting. Open this book so that we may know you better. In your son's name, amen. So family, family is whacked, right? <clears throat> There's a story about a pregnant woman. She doesn't have a husband anymore. She doesn't have her parents anymore. She only has her one brother in life. And her brother's a little off, let's just say. He's kind of a strange guy. A little slow, a little different. Well, the pregnant mother, she actually gets in a car accident. She goes into a coma. While she's in the coma, the doctor has to do the delivery to save the babies. A couple weeks later, the mother wakes up and the doctor says, congratulations, you had twins. It's a boy and it's a girl. And the mother kind of dazed says, well, but what are their names? I wasn't here to name them. The doctor said, oh, your brother stepped in. He took care of all of it. And the mother is worried because she knows he's not that sharp. And she goes kind of hesitantly, well, what's the name? And he's, the doctor says, well, he named the girl Denise. And the mother sits there and she thinks, she kind of wrestles with it and she accepts it. And she, oh, that's a nice name. I like Denise. What's the boy's name? The doctor says, Denephew. 
Not that smart. Family is messed up sometimes, right? Denise and the nephew. <laughs> well, family is messed up here too. We've got Abram and Lot. <clears throat> um, Pobody's nerfed, and we are about to continue to see that be the case here. A little bit of background. I know we went through this last week in Genesis 12, but Abram and Lot and Sarah were in Egypt, right? And they went down there because there was a famine, and Abram messed up, and he lied, and could you imagine God blessed him in the process? <laughs> and he became exceedingly wealthy. Well, he is persona non grata from Egypt now. They ask him to leave. You cannot come back. I was told over the weekend that Elon Musk is persona non grata in the country of Brazil. My family, my father-in-law and mother-in-law from there because he said something on Twitter and Brazil said, you can't come in, sorry. So Abram is persona non grata in Egypt. Cannot come back. You're out of here, dude. And now he's wandering again. The man who God gave a promise to, who said, you're going to have these descendants, right? He's already blessed him once. He's already told him about the promise. And he's wandering through the desert. He has no country, no place to go. He returns to the same place that he previously built an altar and worshiped the Lord, by no coincidence. And here he calls on the name of the Lord. I wonder what he said. I don't know, <laughs> but I can tell you what I would say is whatever was on my heart. I don't know what Abram said. He was the father of, of the Jewish faith, right? The patriarch, like an all-star, the goat, as Pastor Tom talks about sometimes. <clears throat> I know I'm not, but all I can tell you is if I was in a tough situation like that, I would hope that I could just call on the name of the Lord and say, God, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on. I'm afraid. I'm worried. I'm sad. He called on the name of the Lord. That's all it is, guys. There's no perfection, right? And this is what Abram does is he calls on the name of the Lord in this very moment, this very place again. Well, <clears throat> there's quarrels and there's fighting now, right? Right? Why is there quarrels and fighting? Because as it says in here, it says, let me make sure I read it. Abram had become very wealthy. This very wealthy is an interesting choice of words. Very rich or very wealthy. Very is moad and wealthy is kabad. <clears throat> very means very. Exceedingly, a lot of. Wealthy is an interesting word. The root word of Kabad, wealthy in Hebrew, is heavy, burdensome. Now, it can both mean a positive and a negative in any given situation. The positive can be you've got a lot of stuff, plentiful. The negative is you're weighed down, you're burdened. So I'm going to ask the question here with Abram's wealth, is it good or is it bad? Right? Well, it's actually good. He's been blessed by the Lord. But I think in our culture, especially nowadays, it's easy for this uh, class well warfare to kind of come up. Ah, oh, the rich, they're bad, right? The 1%. And I'm not here to say yes or no. I just am observing. <clears throat> but I think in our, in our church, it's very important to recognize that wealth, we need to view wealth not the way the world views it. That wealth can be a burden. Absolutely, it can be a burden. It can also be a blessing. And in this instance, it's a blessing to Abram. God has blessed Abram. But it has been part of the result of this quarrel. These men have too much stuff. They can't get along. Their herdsmen can't get along. So brothers and sisters, let us be diligent about wealth. If you don't have it, let us be diligent. If you have it, let us be diligent. To a large degree, degree, excuse me, the wealth is irrelevant. What's relevant is you and your loving father. If you have wealth, let's hope that God is first and wealth follows. If you don't have wealth, let's hope that God is first and whatever you do have follows. 
Wealth and the believer is a super heavy topic, and we could go on and on about it, but we just want to take note here that the word wealthy is burdensome, heavy, and exceeding, and it's something to guard and protect, be careful with. As a result, there's this quarrel with Abram and Lot's herdsmen, right? Even though Abram has everything, and Lot has what Lot has because of Abram, I want us to recognize that. Abram went with Lot to Egypt and the men didn't have much. Because Lot was in Egypt, he received some of the reward. From a spiritual context, this is really important for us to grasp as well. Have you seen or identified someone in this church or outside of this church that you think is just following the Lord and they are brimming with joy and it's a pleasure to be around and they seem to be overflowing with God's goodness? Go hang out with them. (laughs) like the earthly riches that Lot received because of simply his association with Abram. He became wealthy because of association. There's a spiritual lesson here. We can continue to receive God's love and joy and good things in part by being around those people who demonstrate that, who receive that. There was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal last week And I have to admit, whenever I quote the Wall Street Journal, like 5% of the time I actually sit down and read the whole article because it's the whole like Twitter mentality, right? Oh, there's the headline. There's the first three sentences and I read it and then I move on. So I didn't read it, but I saw the headline and it talked about people and church and it talked about their mental well-being, that there's studies that said people who come to church and have community and connection have a better well-being. Their mental well-being is healthier. And it's not by coincidence, like whatever Wall Street Journal, thank you very much, but this was here before you, right? Hopefully we don't just read the tagline and then swipe left on this one. Hang out with people who are overflowing with God's love. Hang out with people who are exceedingly wealthy in the things of the Lord. Lot experienced possession because he was hanging out with Abram. Lot is about to experience an amazing grace that he does not deserve because of his uncle Abram. Now what is Abram doing here? There's a quarrel, the land is too small, there's all this cattle for both sides of the family, they can't get enough food for the animals. And so the herdsmen are fighting all the time, right? I wanna read a psalm to kind of set the stage for what Abram's doing. I actually think Derek sang a little bit about this from a different psalm earlier, but Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robe. It It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore. How good it is when we live in peace. This is what Abram's doing. He's saying, look, you guys are fighting. This is Lot, come here, buddy. This is, we don't need this. Let's just get along. Let's chill, dude. Abram is a peacemaker. And as Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. That's awesome. My sons, my goal is that first I can be a good father, is that I can teach them good things, I can demonstrate good things to them, and that they would emulate those good things in their own way, that they would be a mini-me in their own way, right? And so blessed is the peacemaker, for they will be called sons of God, that you and I, brothers and sisters, when we create peace, when we enforce peace, when we live peace, convey peace to others, you're being a mini-me of the Lord. He is the, the peacemaker, the prince of peace, right? That's what he wants is peace. He came to this world. The father gave his son up as a peace offering to you. Whoa, wait a second. I'm deserving of a peace offering from God? He should come to me? This is our father, You want to be his son and daughter? Make peace. Constantly make peace. And Abram is making peace here. (laughs) 
Now, is Abram making peace because he's already been blessed? Remember, he was blessed a couple chapters ago before he went to Egypt, right? It's kind of like wealthy. It's easy for us, or for many people who maybe don't have as much wealth, to look at a wealthy person who is maybe a little bit generous and say, well, that's easy for you. You got all the money in the world, right? It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't make any difference. Eh, maybe, but... Don't pretend, don't act like you know me, right? Like everybody's situation is unique and we can't judge the heart of a man or woman. (laughs) But it is easy for people who have wealth and who love the Lord and who put God first and wealth second. I've seen it time and time again. It's not only easy, it's fun for believers who have resource to give. It's fun for them. I watch it. The joy on their face, the things that they talk about Abraham has been blessed first and now he is creating peace in the same way he's been given the resource to make this peace. He's actually, think of it this way, he's metabolized God's blessing. You know, an athlete goes out and exercises and runs whatever, lifts their weights or swims their laps or whatnot. And they finish that training and they get back to their house and a good athlete will refresh what they needed. They'll drink protein, they'll eat protein, they'll drink water, they'll drink Gatorade, electrolytes, whatever that they've lost, they'll bring back in because the body needs to metabolize that nutrition. It needs to absorb that nutrition to repair what it's lost and prepare for the next, right? Abram is metabolizing God's blessing in this. God has come to him previous and he says that you're mine. And I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to hook you up. I just have to ask, like, is he being so gracious to Lot here because he knows he's been blessed? And that's kind of the, not irony, but that's the dance of faith. Where is Jesus? I don't have him here. Where is his promise and his blessing? I can't actually grab it. It's the evidence of things hoped for, right? That we believe what he said is true and we act on that. Abram is acting on it. He's metabolized the blessing of the Lord. The other part in this way that he's making peace is he's not just throwing a bone to Lot, right? He's not like, hey man, like go over there in the corner where there's a little bit of grass and you can take yours. Let me just like, well, this coral, I'm going to stop this fight, okay? And you go have the scraps and, oh, but it'll be okay because it's really good over there. No. He gives him the choice, the choicest. He lets him make the choice, whatever you want. I'm going to step back and I'm going to let you take what you need. (laughs) Philippians 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Wait, let me read that again. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. And I really wish we could do a word study on do nothing, because do you know what do nothing means? Do nothing. <clears throat> do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, right? Isn't that what Abram's doing here? I mean, granted, he's rich, he's got everything that he needs. But is that why he's doing it? No, he's been blessed by God. He believes God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And now he's doing nothing out of selfish ambition. He's not trying to get ahead. He's not looking at the quarrel with the herdsman as an opportunity to better himself. He's putting Lot, as it says in Philippians, he's looking to his interests. He's putting him above himself. He's looking to Lot to take care of Lot for the goodness of Lot because it's the right thing to do. And I'm guilty of this. How many times do I get into an argument or a scuffle or some sort of disagreement and I try to win? And at some point, it's not even about what we're talking about, right? That's irrelevant, actually. And now it's about who's going to win. Who's going to come out on top? That's selfish ambition and that's vain conceit and I'm guilty of it. So Abram has blessed the socks off of Lot here. 
The other thing that's really interesting to notice about this, Abram's the elder, Lot's the younger. (laughs) We'll talk more about that because it's really interesting to kind of open up. Now, Lot looks, he sees the land, he sees the area near Sodom that is well watered like the Garden of Eden. And that's what he chooses, right? (laughs) As I was driving here, I was listening to some like classical music to try and calm down and get in a good space, right? And this song came on that was just a violin. And I've said it before, I love violins. But violin can have this heavy, somber feeling to it sometimes, right? Maybe that's partly why I like it. But I just thought... Like in my mind, if Hollywood properly took this passage and they show Lot going down to the valley and establishing his tents near Sodom, I just heard the heavy, sad violin. This is the beginning. (laughs) It's not by coincidence that it says he put his tents near Sodom. And then it's not by coincidence that it says that Sodom was sinning greatly. We're setting up for the next time we get to see Lot. Actually, for us in a couple weeks. But the next time that we hear about Lot, he's in deep doo-doo. He's in trouble. As Joshua says, when Caleb does something wrong, my younger boy Joshua, when he sees his bigger brother do something wrong, he says, he needs a spanking, right, Dad? Lot's ready for a spanking next time we see him. <clears throat> Lot also, again, he wasn't, he didn't defer to Abram. Remember the story of Ruth and Naomi? And Naomi, or Ruth says, I won't leave you. And she says, no, you will leave me. Go back with the other, your other sisters-in-law. They went back, they'll find another husband, they'll live their life, go ahead. I won't leave you. I am bound to you. We don't see that with Lot here, do we? He doesn't question Abram at all. He doesn't say, oh, uncle, it's okay. Maybe you take it, or oh, that's so nice of you, or anything. He just takes it and goes. This is the beginning. A little yeast works through the whole dough, right? What am I talking about? I'm talking about sin. This is sin, ladies and gentlemen, and the beginning of it. This is where it starts. You know, you hear about people who maybe have a drug addiction or some sort of addiction. They didn't, like, go from Sunday school and, you know, drinking Gatorade to, like, excuse me, doing heroin or something like that. Rarely. It's a progression. It's a little bit over time. And it's no coincidence that Lot sees something good. He wants to go there, and he gets close to Sodom. He just gets close. He just sets his his tents there, and he can see what's going on. Psalm 1, 1. I don't think it's any coincidence that the Psalms start out with this. Ready? Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat or in the company of mockers. This is a progression. Blessed is the person who isn't even just walking in the same direction as the sinners, just kind of close by association. Or someone who stands in their way, who is just kind of like, you know, casually conversing with them. Not walking anymore. Now we've stopped and we'll we'll take a moment to, to engage. Oh, we're not walking anymore. We're not standing. We're seated. We're seated. We're sitting with them. We're communing with them. We're dining with them. This progression of sin The enemy is like a lion looking to destroy us, prowling around, and he's crafty. And he doesn't have to knock you off your block really quick to get you to fall. He just needs a little little treat. And how do I know this? Because I speak from personal experience as well. None of us are immune to this. Our sin may look different in what it is, but it's the same at the heart. It's defiance against God. It's not believing And it's going to happen and continue to happen, brothers and sisters. We know that. But a little yeast works through the whole batch. Just a little bit to start. Uh, 
I want to read another, another verse really quick. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In all this you greatly rejoice, no, though now for a little while you may have hurt, had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. We've talked about Lot. Now let's come back to Abram. This must have been tough for him. This must have been really tough for Abram. And what 1 Peter is saying here, he may have have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, but they've come to prove your faith like gold passing through the fire and being refined. Sometimes I wish it wasn't this way, but this is the way it is, and the better we can accept this and go forward in it, this is how it needs to be, and this is actually the love of the Lord, is that too often when things are always too easy, we should watch out. Things were easy for Lot here. He got what he wanted. He viewed something good something that was satisfying to his eyes, to his flesh, to the thought of multiplying his possessions even further, the well-watered land. Abram, not only does Abram get disrespected by Lot, now he lost his, his nephew, and now he has to go and search for some land for his own possessions, and he has to wander through the desert. But this has happened So that the proven genuineness of his faith, which is greater, has a greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when he returns. The more and more I walk through this world and I live this life and try to follow the Lord, the more I realize there is a promise that it's going to be tough. That's part of following the Lord. This is why we're going through Genesis. Has this been a very easy read? Has it been light? You know, like a day, daily soap opera or something? This is like, as we go through this, guys, this is crazy. The stuff these people did, the stuff that they went through, nobody had it on easy street. Let alone Abram, the father, the patriarch. He had it tough. And he's going to continue to have it tough. I think this is how we walk with the Lord is it's going to be tough, but you're not going to be alone. <clears throat> Before we talk about who Abram is with and kind of the pain that he just went through, but then the blessing, I want to read something from a commentary. This gentleman's name, Matthew Henry. Has anybody heard of Matthew Henry? I got to admit, I steal his stuff all the time. I may not be the best preacher in the world, but I know enough that if it's from the spirit, you can plagiarize it, so. You've got Lot and Abram. Lot sees the good stuff. He goes and he takes it. Abram is left with the desert. <laughs> Here's from Matthew Henry, and it's a little long, but bear with me. Sensual choices are sinful choices and seldom speed well. He's dead, by the way, so he speaks in this kind of older English way. Those who in choosing relations callings, dwellings, or settlements are guided and governed by the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eye, or the pride of life, and consult not the interests of their souls or their religion, cannot expect God's presence with them nor his blessing upon them, but are commonly disappointed, even in that which they principally aimed at and missed and miss of that which they promised themselves satisfaction in. In all our choices, this principle should overrule us, that that is best for us, which is best for our souls. I love what he says there, and I'm going to kind of break it down in today's language. He's basically saying people who go after the lust of the flesh and they get what they want, it never is what they wanted. They don't, we, I, not they, I don't have satisfaction if I achieve the lust of the flesh. It's not what I thought it was going to be. That that is best for us, which is best for our souls. 
There's a different way of living here, and Abram is demonstrating that. He's gracious to Lot. Well, going forward, now at the end of this, God blesses Abram again. (laughs) And what does Abram do? He worships. It's so beautiful. God comes and he blesses him with his blessing again, your descendants and the dust of the ground, etc. I don't think it's coincidence that God came and blessed Abram after Lot left. Not that Lot was something bad necessarily, but that Abram had to go through a very challenging, sad time, and God shows up. It's like the dark night of the soul, that concept, that as you're going through a tough time, when you think it's the darkest and the hardest and the worst, it's right before the dawn. Again, I don't know why, but that's when God shows up. (laughs) He'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. The other piece I want you to notice about Abram here is he actually offered half of his promise because remember earlier the blessing a couple chapters ago, I will give you all the land you see, Abram. Abram just told Lot, you go there. You take half. Abram's sharing his blessing. And I think he's also saying, I believe that God's word will still ring true, but I know that peace is important here. God will take care of me. He said he would. The departure of Lot must have made Abram sad. The departure of my friends and my family make me sad. But there's always communion with the Lord. And God shows up after and he talks to Abram after the sadness of the departure. The other thing I want us to recognize here toward the end is... God says, look at the land. Lift up your eyes and look at the land. And what does Abram do? He walks through the land. God said, I promised this land to you, didn't he? (laughs) And Abram's like, I'm going to check it out, actually. Okay, cool. You said you're going to promise something? I'm not just going to sit in my library and read my book and pray to you and and say, okay, yeah, I understand conceptually that you give me these promises. And so I'm just going to like do these mental gymnastics and this like soul searching and And that's the end of the entire journey. That's not it. God said, I'm going to give you this land, Abram. And why don't you look up and see it and go and walk it? And what does Abram do? Gets up and off he goes. He checks it out. Psalms 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Why would it say taste and see? God says he's going to do something for you. Brothers and sisters, if he says something in this book, I challenge you to ask him to prove himself to you. If he says, ask for peace, and the peace will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus beyond understanding, to not be anxious about anything, but in everything ask for this peace, as it says in Philippians, ask him to prove true. Taste and see. He's going to show up. He always does. It may not be exactly how we think it is or when, it's gonna, when it should happen, but he will show up and his blessing will continue to be true. <clears throat> well, this last part here is yet again, Abram built an altar and he worshiped God here. And this is a common theme with Abram. He continues to build these altars. He built an altar a couple chapters ago. He's building an altar again. In the beginning of this chapter, he called on the name of the Lord. At the end of this chapter, he builds an altar and he worships. Many chapters from here, we're going to hear about an altar that he builds up on the mountain. And he's about to sacrifice his own son. But he's always worshiping. He's a man of worship because as it says in Hebrews... He's looking forward to a city whose very foundation is God himself. He was an alien in his own country. But where was he always at home? It was at worship. It was at worship when he's blessed. It was at worship when he's challenged. And it's at worship when God shows up. He was a man of worship. And the last thing that I'll leave you with is that I believe those of us who seek peace and want to create peace, 
Worship is a result of that. God is a God of peace, and he wants to be worshiped by you. Seeking his peace, experiencing his peace, tasting that the Lord is good, as it says in Psalms here, and taking refuge in him, seeking and tasting that peace results in worship, communion, just this perfect harmony with the Lord. And that's what Abram is experiencing, and that's what he tried to convey a lot. And I believe that's what we do here, which is great. And I'm so happy to be a part of this church. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your word, for your promises. And I thank you for always walking with us. I pray for those here today that we would be able to metabolize your word, that we would take your word, your very presence and your relationship and that we would walk forward in your goodness and that we would worship you more and more. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I just want to go back at you, Tyler. We're really glad you're a part of this church too. I want to pause for a moment and give you a chance to do a couple of things. One, if you'd like to turn in a connection card, let us know you're here, questions about the church, get the newsletter, things like that. Uh, I hope you'll continue. If this is your home church, you'll continue to worship God through your giving. There's two ways to do that. In your chair is an envelope and a connection card. You can fill those out, and then when you leave, put them in the box. If you scan the QR code on the welcome card, you can do that. It will take you right to the website, and it's all easy peasy. I want to show with you a very important way your giving is making a really huge impact. Bring up my slide, please. Look familiar? <laughs> Those are our spring banners. And so we change these out seasonally, and we also change them out when we have big events like Easter and Christmas in particular. And each one sends a different message. And this one's really important because Easter helps us understand we are a new creation. And, and I hope you sense that, that you are a new creation. There are things in your life that are still the same. The struggle Tyler talked about, that's just part of the fallen human condition. But there's this newness in us. And I hope that encourages you when you come in and you see that. I hope as you visit or you see out there in streaming land, that speaks to you. They're really, really colorful. A couple people, they went up just last week. A couple people noticed them. But here's another reason why it's really, really important. This sanctuary gets a lot of use by outside groups. They are secular groups. We have two very high-end groups that, that come here, one every Thursday, one about two or three times a quarter. They come in here to sing and practice, and guess what they're looking at? They're seeing that message, that word of God, and it's getting to them in a way that we could never get to them. And we have other groups that use this for different reasons. They're seeing the same thing, and they're leaving. Maybe they're talking about it, and that's all possible because you're giving. These things are not cheap, by the way but they're powerful. So thank you so much for your giving. Believe me, God's taking that beauty there and the, his word that's always on them, and he's speaking to people in powerful, powerful ways, all because you're giving. So thanks so much. Take about two minutes, and then we're going to wrap it up with a closing song.
All right. Well, it's been a great morning, hasn't it? Please stand. This is a great send-off song. One of my favorites. I'm sure you know it. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. I'm thinking about Abram there, right? Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, in the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Now when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is your home church. You know what to do. If you need some prayer, Christine and Wally would love to pray for you. I want to invite every one of you to our planning session in about 20 minutes, which will be 1133 in the garden room. We're going to plan to honor our moms and dads on those days coming up in May and June. It's a great way to get to know people in the church, have some fun, plan, things like that. So if you're new to the church, this is where you get connected, even if it's your first day to day. And then I, I hope you'll go out and be an, and I talked about being an ambassador for God last week, and I always challenge you to go and share the good news you heard today, and God has set that up for you. And Tyler, you did an amazing, amazing job as always to give us a lot of good news. Yes. 
And so go forth and do that. I want to leave you with this blessing, and that's this. Go beholding God, beholding you, and smiling in deep, deep delight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.